PKSH, the number one in market expansion services. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in DKSH's Patient Solutions webinar series. My name is Sheena Flannery. I am Director of Communications for Business Unit Healthcare, and I will be moderating our session today. So before we start, I just want to mention a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being held on Microsoft Teams live event. So all participants are automatically muted and you will only see and hear our speakers today. You can interact with us if you like to. We have a little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen that you can see and you can feel free to ask any questions at any time. But please note that we will only go through the questions at the end of our session today. We will also be making a recording of the session and it will be made available on YouTube as well as our website under the insights section. So today's session is titled Going Beyond the Pill, Patient Support Programs in Asia Pacific. We have three speakers with us today. Firstly, I'd like to welcome and also thank you to our colleagues from Bain and Company. Vikram Kapoor and Alex Bolton join us from Singapore today. Vikram leads Bain's healthcare practices in Asia Pacific, and he has over 20 years experience in consulting and healthcare across the entire healthcare value chain. Alex leads the healthcare practices for Southeast Asia specifically, and he also brings with him extensive experience in healthcare in advising payers, providers, and also investors in the region. The two of them together are the authors of the Bain & Company report called Asia Pacific Frontline of Healthcare Report 2020. I'm sure many of you have seen this report already. Today, Vikram and, Kapoor and, um, and Alex will be focusing on macro perspectives of the healthcare ecosystem in APAC, current trends, as well as changing expectations and adaptation of new digital healthcare tools. Um, in the meantime, I'm showing you also on the side our um, agenda for today. Our third speaker today is going to be DKSH's very own Christiana Irimescu. She is Senior Manager in Business Unit Healthcare, and she manages our strategic alliances with pharmaceutical companies across Asia Pacific. Christiana has robust know-how in developing and executing go-to-market strategies for patient support programs, and today she will in fact be talking about patient support programs. She will also be discussing current as well as emerging trends and how they are transforming patient engagement in Asia Pacific. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Alex Bolton from Bain & Company. Alex, over to you. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Alex Bolton. Uh, I'm a partner with Bain & Company based in Southeast Asia, leading our healthcare practice uh, in, in the region. I've lived in Singapore for the past 20 years and joining me today, uh, as Sheila mentioned, is Vikram Kapoor, who leads our healthcare practice for Asia Pacific, and he is also based in Singapore. Bain & Company is one of the world's leading health care strategy consulting firms, having supported 80% of the top healthcare companies globally across payers, providers, pharma, medtech, and digital health. Feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more about our project experience in Southeast Asia. I've listed our emails on this page for your reference. At the end of 2019, we launched a series of, uh, of patient and physician surveys across APAC markets to test, among other things, openness to digital health tools. The timing of this survey was highly fortuitous as it was just before the advent of the COVID-19 crisis and before all primary surveys become clouded and coloured by the current uncertainty. We prepared a collection of these survey insights to share with you today, and I would suggest you interpret these as the patient and physician perceptions just pre-COVID. So to start, Asia Pacific's healthcare ecosystem is at a tipping point. We are experiencing a huge demand wave for healthcare services from APAC's 2 billion population, with rising affordability, coupled with the accelerating needs associated with an aging population and rising chronic illness. In the next decade, Asia will contribute over 60% of the global increase in population over 65 years old and will become home to over 250 million diabetic individuals. 
Add to this a critically constrained supply of medical services with less than one doctor per thousand population across Southeast Asia on average and double digit healthcare inflation. The entire ecosystem risks a breaking. We're already hearing this creaking strain in the form of access challenges with lengthening hospital wait times, skyrocketing costs and substandard patient outcomes across many of our markets. In the context of this, the ecosystem stakeholders in the region are faced with the multifaceted challenge of increasing accessibility, uh, improving affordability while delivering quality outcomes for patients. In our frontline of healthcare report in Asia Pacific published earlier this year, we called out six key trends that will shape healthcare over the next decade. First of which, changing demographics, aging populations and chronic disease. Second, rising costs and the escalating or runaway medical inflation. Third, shifting consumer expectations. The consumer has been trained by e-commerce last mile delivery, convenient to find waiting for anything to be unacceptable. And they're also inclined to check their symptoms with Dr. Google before they even set foot in a hospital. Technological and medical transformation is the fourth. The fifth is physician capacity or rather under capacity. And six, regulators are truly stepping up with the advent of universal health care in markets like Indonesia and the Philippines, for example. Pre-COVID, we identified four future back opportunities for the APAC healthcare ecosystem participants across the value chain. The first opportunity that we saw as we put all these findings together was the opportunity to empower the consumer with a single touch point for care. Consumers want a single touch point, physical or virtual, to manage their health care instead of a complicated web of disconnected care journeys that they face today. Consumers also want greater ownership and to take more control over their health care. They're open to changing their health care behaviours if, and it's a, a big if, they receive guidance from a trusted professional that is truly backing their care and is fighting their corner. Second, transitioning, the second opportunity is transitioning care outside of hospital walls, shifting non-emergency services to outpatient or alternative settings to relieve overcrowded hospitals. It's shocking to think that there are still country markets in APAC where patients perceive two choices for primary care, self-medicate at a pharmacy or go straight to a hospital. And this mindset must and will change to achieve better outcomes at lower costs. The third opportunity is to increase consumer access to digital tools and platforms. Even pre-COVID, we were seeing a tremendous interest in telemedicine, self-diagnosis apps, long-term illness management tools, and electronic rec health records. Um, and lastly, there is a material opportunity to support physicians with AI, automation, machine learning, to really maximize the impact from those scarce resources. Uh, and it will enable them to, uh, to make uh, better clinical decision making and also um, will scale their impact. And of course, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis has been to accelerate each of these opportunities. They're no longer future back, but suddenly here and now. And it's essential that the ecosystem adapts quickly. So on this first data slide, we share some patient survey responses across the region that outline the first opportunity to empower consumers with a single touch point for care. The typical patient of the past treated healthcare with both fear and reverence. I trust my doctor implicitly, but I would rather only visit when something's really wrong in an acute situation because the doctor will always find something. Pre-COVID, a new type of patient was already emerging in APAC, one that has an interest in health maintenance and lifestyle changes, a consumer that expects convenience in addition to quality of care, a patient consumer that researches their symptoms online before speaking to a doctor. And what's more, a patient that expects a more responsive doctor, one that's reachable over WhatsApp uh, and other communication devices and is happy to schedule appointments through mobile apps. Further to this point, an overwhelming majority of the 1800 patients we surveyed indicated a preference for a single touch point to manage their care across the continuum in place of the fragmented ecosystem and health seeking journey that may face today. A good 70% said that they would prefer a single portal uh, when asked. What's most interesting is that the majority, 60 to 70% across many of these markets, still have a preference for that single portal of care to be a physical offline location, stressing the continued importance of a primary care physician that sits at the nexus of this, uh, this care journey, quarterbacking care. 
Of all the countries surveyed, Singapore was the most likely in terms of the patients in Singapore to accept a digital application as their single portal for healthcare. Um, perhaps indicating a longer term trajectory for other markets as the primary care experience becomes more integrated across digital and the, the offline experience. But nevertheless, I think this does stress that the offline primary care delivery and that physical patient experience with a physician remains an essential component of the ecosystem. Now, as ecosystem stakeholders rush to claim the role of that single portal to manage health, building patient trust will be a critical ingredient and may result in different end states in each market. We asked patients how much they would trust each payer provider stakeholder to coordinate their care. Who do they trust the most? Now, primary care clinics commanded the highest level of trust to quarterback patient care in Australia, in India and in Singapore, whereas patients in the largely hospital first markets of China, Indonesia and Thailand tended to believe that they cannot be made well unless they visit a hospital and receive medicine. You may also notice that in Indonesia, the trust levels are quite low in general at 65 percent versus north of 70 percent in many other markets. Um, and it's seen in practice through the significant amount, amount of medical tourists that leave that country each year for more trusted tertiary care providers in markets like Malaysia and, and Thailand. In India, the other thing that jumps out on this page, uh, you're seeing the trust levels are, are super high and tech companies have built just an astonishing level of patient trust in quite a short period of time, such that they are trusted in many ways to a, a high degree and almost at a similar level to many of the hospitals. Now on to the second opportunity, transitioning care outside the hospital walls. Doctors have long understood that most non-acute services can be delivered in lower cost outpatient settings, but now we're seeing a meaningful level of comfort from patient populations. For example, across APAC, about 60% of patients said that they were ready to receive chronic disease, ma disease management outside of a hospital compared to almost 100% that recognize that it's completely deliverable uh, for doctors. This presents a tremendous access and cost saving opportunity. The third is the opportunity for increased consumer access to digital tools and platforms. Remember these are pre-COVID responses and they will be a, quite a bit different today as everyone's been forced to use telemedicine. But just pre-COVID, 22% of surveyed patients across the region claimed that they had used telemedicine in the past 12 months and 46% were already open to using it in the next five years. 27% had used digital tools for long-term illness management and 48% were willing to use it in the next five years. What's most interesting though, is that 95% of patients surveyed said that they would be willing to use digital health tools if those tools were covered by their insurance provider. There's a clear openness on the part of the patient to use these tools and indeed, this may be the answer to bending the cost curve in this region in the face of that huge demand wave and the supply side tipping point. And lastly, in terms of supporting physicians, our survey identified a strong willingness among the physician base, uh, sorry, the physician base across APAC markets to leverage digital efficiency enablers from telemedicine to AI diagnostics. As a reading example, 28% of surveyed physicians had used remote patient monitoring in the past 12 months, but almost two thirds were ready to use it in the next five years if it were to be made available. So we've really trimmed down the amount of, of survey output. And if you'd like to read more on uh, about these trends and about some of the findings from a survey perspective, please do read the report. We can ensure that our friends share it round. But to recap, there were four overarching opportunities that we saw pre-COVID. First, to empower consumers with a single touch point for care. Second, to transition care outside hospital walls. Third, to increase consumer access to digital tools and platforms, and then fourth to support physicians with AI, automation and machine learning. And what we're finding is that with many of the conversations that we're having with payers, with providers and other stakeholder participants, these trends and the acceleration of these trends are really coming to the front of the strategies of many of our, our clients. And so we've been working on several of these, including uh, up to and including building digital apps and integrated online offline experiences 
that create that single touch point of care for, uh, for patients that have access. So with that, I'll pause. I'll hand over to Vikram Kapoor to share some thoughts about how more recently the COVID crisis has impacted this lay of the land and accelerated some of these trends. Thank you, Alex. So nine, month, nine months in, in, into this pandemic, as the world starts to enter some version of a, of a recovery phase, there continues to be a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the new normal is, is yet to be defined as we look on, uh, you know, we see potentially three different scenarios. There's a, there's a shock in recovery, uh, potentially extended suppression followed by control mitigation, and then a sequence of suppression due to lack of control. And as we look at markets across Asia Pacific, you would see markets at various levels and on various places on these, these three different curves. Uh, there's still several unanswered questions that span many areas that we will all navigate through uh, over the next several months and years. First, from a science perspective, the timing of a vaccine, levels of immunity, transmission rates, optimal testing methodologies, uh, the duration of this pandemic. The world is starting to reopen with, with all countries at different stages. However, there is still no consensus on how long the effects of, of the pandemic will last. Some forecasts this get pushed out to 2022. Uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, the breadth and depth of the impending recession, the return of inflation, uh, the large amounts of leverage in various debt markets, and then frankly, uh, and finally, the, the government and measures being taken to de- and reconfine and, and fiscal incentives. So what's been the impact on uh, the healthcare ecosystem? So if we go to the next page, you know, the near-term impact of the pandemic on, on the healthcare ecosystem has been quite pronounced and uneven. On one end, you have providers balancing a flooding of acute care sites, while at the same time, elective procedures have stalled, and we're seeing an unprecedented adoption of telemedicine. Medtech companies saw a rapid step up in demand for products critical to responding to the pandemic, while demand for products used in elective procedures came to a, to a grinding halt. Uh, in many cases, uh, medical device companies and pharma companies found access to hospitals being cut off. Biopharma sponsors saw trial activity temporarily slow, but a massive reallocation of investment towards vaccines and, and therapies to combat the virus. And then finally, payers saw some near-term relief on MLRs as elective procedures were deferred, but they're bracing for potentially a tougher 2022. Now, taking a longer-term lens, uh, COVID-19 has catalyzed some structural shifts to the sector, uh, many of which are even more pronounced in Asia Pacific. Healthcare is now seen as essential infrastructure. Some would argue this is a new national defense. Uh, the transition to alternate Sites of care is accelerating. Alex talked uh, a little bit about that. You know, patients and physicians are increasingly comfortable with care being delivered virtually, uh, even at home or outside the hospital and ambulatory sites of care. Most suppliers have seen the crisis as a, as a call to action to diversify their supply chains. And you've seen that already spur activity in, in, in certain Southeast Asian markets and in India. Uh, as, as many of the global players have looked to, to diversify their supply chain dependence on, on a market like China. Uh, the doctor and sales rep relationship is, is disrupted forever. Uh, and, and you're seeing increasingly uh, a form of, of online and offline engagement between the sales rep and the clinician. And, and finally, we believe the, the pressure of this pandemic will spark a, a wave of, of consolidation with a flight to quality across sectors. Uh, that being said, we, we believe at, at a macro level, uh, this pandemic has put healthcare further up on the list of priorities for governments, for, for investors, and for patients. And we believe longer term, Asia Pacific will continue to see uh, significant growth potential. Uh, and we are very energized by, by what lies ahead of us. Uh, in terms, in terms of healthcare opportunity in the region. So with that, let us, let us hand over now to, to Christina to talk to us about Beyond the Pill.
So thank you, Alex and Vikram, uh, for your presentation and uh, rich uh, insights. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you are well, uh, healthy and enjoyed our session so far. It is a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, in the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, I would like to share several observations um, related to patient support programs in Asia that we in the KSH have gathered over the past uh, five years uh, since we have joined the patient support um, effort. Then I will continue my presentation uh, by uh, bringing into your attention um, several potential strategies for further unlock uh, the value of all patient support programs. And then uh, I will close my presentation by um, advancing uh, some um, emerging trends um, in uh, patient support programs that you might watch uh, over the next uh, two, three years. So I have a very ambitious agenda for uh, today. So uh, Shina, let's get started. Thank you. Um, so before uh, discussing about patient support trends, I would like to build on two of my key takeaways messages from Alex and uh, Vikram presentation. So Alex highlighted very well that patients in Asia are currently facing an increased pressure regarding uh, affordability. 62% of uh, patients find drugs cost being too high. Now, in addition to the affordability challenge, um, they do have also a challenge in terms of the access. Access to the physicians um, and the time that they are spending together with their um, uh, physician. So if we look across uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we are noticing that in average, uh, a patient is visiting physician around two times per year. Now we have countries like Cambodia, for example, well, they are actually visiting once per year or even less a physician. Now, when they are actually visiting the physician, they are spending little time with the physician for the uh, uh, consultation. In Asia, in average, the time per consultation is around five minutes. If we look at Indonesia, for example, or Hong Kong is around two minutes. So to conclude, I would say that in the, the risk and the challenges that patients in Asia are facing in terms of uh, affordability and access are increasing uh, the risk in terms of non-adherence, treatment failures, and risk of hospitalization or re-hospitalization. Next. Thank you. Then on a second, I would say, a second takeaway from, from Alex and Vikram presentation is that um, there is a major shift in terms of patient and uh, physician expectations. Patients, they, are, they want more empowerment. They are looking for guidance to improve adherence. Then ACPs, uh, they are focusing more on improved medical outcomes and ensuring an ongoing patient monitoring. Now, if at this picture, we are bringing also two additional stakeholders like payer and pharma, we'll get, I would say, the full picture of the complexity of the healthcare landscape in Asia. Payers, they, now they are looking more into the demonstrated value of the uh, medical treatment, and they are looking for cost um, efficiency. Let's re remember that the healthcare spend in Asia is actually raising two times faster than in the rest of the world. Now, pharma, and, and here uh, I'm actually speaking to, to most of you. So your, I would say, uh, needs and expectations are becoming more and more complex and diverse. On one hand, of course, for pharma companies, it's important to understand the patient journey. Um, in the same time, you would like to ensure the, uh, the product usage and stay time of your products. Um, increase the brand differentiation for your uh, products. And last but not least, ensuring that your products are becoming, are, are becoming reimbursed. Next. Thank you. Now, I, I, I remember that five years ago when I, I was coming to, to Asia, at that time, uh, patient support programs was rather something nice to have. 
they were a couple of pioneers, pharma pioneers in the patient support field. Uh, but at that time, I, I remember there were not uh, many patient support programs or diverse patient support programs in Asia. Now, if I'm looking five years later, um, uh, we are noticing that PSP is becoming a must to have um, in, in our space. Why? Because on one hand, the specialty spending is actually increasing and the demand for specialty care is increasing um, in Asia. Secondly, the increase of complexity in terms of specialty treatment put um, uh, a higher pressure on the ACPs to, to understand the treatment protocols. And last but not least, we are going back to our earlier point in terms of affordability of specialty products in, in Asia. Looking across uh, top uh, um, specialty care products, the value per unit of, of these products is, I would say, on the high side for many of our uh, patients. So I, based on my, I would say, observation and our observation in, in the KSH, definitely we, we feel that patient support programs um, is becoming an important avenue for you and, and most of us in order to address some of the potential challenges, but also some of the needs that uh, all key stakeholders are actually sharing um, in, uh, in Asia. Next. Thank you. So let's, let's spend a bit of time in, in uh, looking at what type of patient support programs we are seeing today in Asia. And, and I want you know, to, to highlight it, that this reflects our own experience uh, based on more than uh, 150 programs that we run over the past five years across several markets in Asia. So what we have observed is that uh, today patient support programs are mainly used to accelerate the accessibility to high uh, cost treatments um, especially when these products or these drugs are not reimbursed or they are reimbursed with restrictions. So if we are looking across, uh, across programs that we are managing, um, we are um, seeing that 68% of these programs are mainly related to financial assistance. Um, or they are 60%, they are related to ins ensuring, securing early access of the treatment in Asia. Um, if we are looking from a treatment point, a point of view, um, no surprise, I would say that most of the patient support programs are related to specialty care, uh, premium treatments like the one in, uh, in hematology, oncology, or rare disease. Interesting, I would say, is that during the past uh, uh, years, we have noticed also new therapeutic areas starting introducing patient support programs. And I, I will highlight here mainly ophthalmology and respiratory. I would say that ophthalmology is one of, I would say, interesting therapeutic area because now that they are moving more into a, a gene therapeutic um, um, space, we will probably see more PSP coming in Asia and across the world in relation to these um, indications. Next. Now, I would like just to give you uh, some, some you know, high level observation in terms of regional trends that we see in relation to patient support programs. So in the past, I would say, the, or traditionally, uh, mainly, um, many of the patient support programs were mainly conducted at the uh, country level. Uh, we were seeing, I would say, a model where we have uh, one, one drug, one patient support at the country level. What is interesting to notice is recently, um, there is a new trend, I would say, uh, coming to, to our region. And that it's, it's related to the um, a consolidation, a centralization of the patient support programs um, uh, across our region. We have noticed that um, there is a tendency of multi-country RFPs, uh, especially embracing a, a kind of cluster approach. Uh, many times we see Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand 
cluster bundled um, in a um, RFP related to patient support programs. So in terms of procurement, we do see a trend at the regional level of centralizing the patient support uh, uh, programs. Now, when we look at the type, uh, type of, of, of PSP that we see in Asia, as previously mentioned, most of the patient support programs that we see across Asia are mainly in relation to financial assistance. Now, going back to the Vikram points, I think now in the context of COVID-19, um, we do see an increase in terms of direct delivery to patients and telemedicines. So the, there is a new, I would say, a type of patient support programs that now is, is building um, in, in our Asia that it's actually more focused on convenience rather than um, accessibility. Now, in terms of the design of the programs, at this point, most, I would say, pharma companies, they are conducting patient support programs dedicated to one uh, brand. We rarely see situation, uh, how, however, now it's starting actually coming this as a, as a potential future trend. Um, um, pharma companies that they are considering um, moving into a more integrating collaborative patient support approach, where instead of focusing on one drug, they are looking into more uh, disease management, the entire therapeutic area with, with potential links between products. However, we are at the early, I would say, stage in terms of uh, moving to a multi-product uh, patient support programs in, in Asia. Next. Thank you. So if I would zoom in a bit more into trends that we see at the country level, it's very interesting to notice that there is, I would say, a, a, a clear profile in terms of, of markets and, and patient support, again, based on our own experience. So in Thailand, what we are noticing is that most of the patient support programs are related to um, uh, financial um, assistance. Um, Malaysia, on the other hand, it's, it's the country with uh, one of the most diverse patient support programs. Um, they, uh, they have a, a, a broad range of, of uh, uh, programs going from affordability, um, adherence, um, access. So it's a diverse, I would say, portfolio in terms of patient support programs. Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong, they are a bit more, I would say, mature in terms of patient support programs. And, and therefore, the focus in those markets is slightly shifting from access to convenience. Singapore, definitely there is an increase in terms of um, direct to patients um, um, programs. In Taiwan, we do have uh, noticed that um, before the reimbursements, um, most of the time the patient supports tend to be more focused on access. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. Now, as soon as the product is reimbursed, um, then uh, the program, the support that uh, pharma companies are bringing to the patients is shifting towards education. Of course, for the programs that they have uh, receive reimbursement with restriction, these access programs uh, and uh, the affordability one might continue um, even after the, the reimbursement. Hong Kong is also special uh, in the sense that here we are observing an increased number of uh, um, named patient program. Uh, the focus is mainly on um, bringing uh, an um, innovation and um, uh, ensuring early access to the patients. Now, if we look at Indochina, and here I will highlight Vietnam, patient support programs are more in their early, early phase. There are a couple of patient support programs now in those, uh, those regions, um, but they are more, I would say, uh, to come in the near future. Next. Thank you. Now, in the next couple of minutes, I would like to share uh, with you um, a couple of uh, strategies um, that potentially might um, uh, unlock the value of your patient support programs or further unlock uh, the, the value of your program. 
Um, I, I, we summarize here, I would say we collected here five key recommendations. So please bear with me. First one, I would say it's mainly focused on ensuring that you are designing a program that builds acceptance and trust with your patient and HCP. Uh, based on our own observation, we have uh, realized that it's very important that the well-designed program is tailored to the patient and ACP's needs with a very clear uh, value proposition to, uh, to all key stakeholders uh, involved in the patient support programs. Um, and it's a, it's a program and it's a design that speaks the language of a patient. So we need actually to ensure that in order, you know, to, to get the acceptance and the trust of patient and HCPs, we are actually speaking their own language and meeting their own expectation from this program. I, we gather here a couple of, you know, I would say checkbox uh, in terms of elements that you might consider when designing a patient support programs. This is more for your own uh, reflection, and I'm quite sure that the list is much longer than what we have collected here. If we move to the second um, uh, key strategies, next, thank you. So if we are looking at a second strategy that we might consider when designing a good uh, program is we need to make sure that the program is actually providing an engaging experience to all stakeholders involved in the patient support programs. And, and in, in this context, um, we believe that digital technology is a great avenue for creating an engaging experience to, to your patients, ACPs, and in general to the entire care uh, network. Now, you might, might uh, remember um, that uh, or, or read through, through the research that Alex and Vikram conducted. Um, just to highlight a couple, I would say, of key findings from their research is that 59% of patients, they are today monitoring their health via technology. Um, also, 70% um, of them, they are looking for single touch point for, for care. So the, the, the importance of leveraging the digital technology to create this engaging experience is becoming, uh, I would say, mandatory for designing a relevant patient support programs. However, I think we need to um, be cautious in terms of finding a right balance between online and offline. Let's remember, you know, that patients in Asia, they are still preferring, 60% of, of the patients are still preferring the physical health clinic. So they still uh, need, I would say, the human interaction in order to manage well um, their uh, medical treatment. So to, 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 I would say, my key takeaway message from, from FIA is that in order to um, have uh, and provide a, a, a strong patient support programs, you will need to, uh, to consider leveraging the digital technology, but also offline uh, solutions for uh, creating an engaging experience to, to your uh, patients that will complement overall your medical solution. Next. Now, our third strategy um, that we'd like to bring to your attention is the importance of gathering insights in order to better understand your patient journey and your patient across uh, his, his or her uh, journey. Um, now, again, if, if I'm reflecting for a second to patient support programs that we have seen over the course five years, most of the patient support programs uh, in the past used to be focused mainly on access affordability. Um, very little or few of them, they were actually focused on or designed to gather uh, insights in terms of the medical outcomes um, or uh, even going uh, further on in, in collecting real world evidence. And we like to bring this to your attention because, of course, based on our own understanding of the landscape, we believe that uh, collecting this type of insights uh, could be qualitative insights, quantitative or medical outcome insights will become uh, very, I would say, crucial 
um, only both for you to understand better uh, the, the patients across their patient journey, but also later on when you will um, uh, potentially build your, your dossier for, for reimbursement. Let's re remember what I mentioned a few seconds ago. Payers are, they want um, a demonstrated value of your products. And collecting this type of insights will give you support in your reimbursement submission. Now, another element that I think is important to highlight here is the importance of consolidating your data um, and your insights at the cohort level, of course, um, to consolidate everything in a single uh, platform, IP platform. Why? Because that will give you the possibility to compare performance, to compare insight across markets and also to leverage one program from one country in a, in a different, different market. So very important cons to consider boosting the level of insights that you are actually generating from the p uh, patient support programs. In our view, our recommendation is that patient support programs should, I would say, move more into a data-driven uh, uh, model um, and uh, a more and, and building more strategic value for you and uh, patients and ACPs. Next. Now, our fourth uh, recommendation uh, or food for thought uh, in relation to uh, designing, uh, building a, a strong patient support, the relevant patient support programs is integrated, how you integrate important insight that you are collecting from your patient, uh, patient support programs into your value proposition and drive brand differentiation. So let's, let's be honest, we all in the pharma industry, um, we want to differentiate our brands. We want to increase the brand awareness among patients and ACPs. So patient support programs, it's, it's giving you um, important insights that could be uh, used in order to uh, differentiate your, your brand experience and also to deliver, uh, I would say, a, more, a message um, and a more emotional engagement and build trust both with your patient but also with your, um, your ACPs. So, one, I would say, a potential recommendation that we'd like actually to, to give in relation to patient support, ensure that when you uh, uh, develop a patient support and execute a patient support, there is a strong collaboration between different functions in your organization, market access, marketing, compliance, because they're all playing a crucial role in order to deliver uh, um, um, valuable patient support programs uh, to your patients and ACPs. Next. And, and going to our last, I would say, last but not least recommendation um, is, um, uh, of course, very close to, to our hearts, um, how you are actually partnering and how you choose the right partner for your patient support programs. Uh, and this is, a, I would say, a crucial conversation um, that uh, uh, we we see now uh, in the uh, patient support uh, patient uh, patient support uh, program framework. Um, so uh, among our recommendation is that make sure that the partner that you are selecting um, is offering you a compliant and integrated platform solution. Going back to one of my previous point, it's very important to be able to collect all the data in a secure manner, in a compliant manner, and analyze, compare that data across markets. So you need one integrated IT platform, compliant and secure one for doing that. Now, secondly, uh, equally important, uh, ensure that your partner is having a strong compliant uh, PSP framework. And, and here I'm thinking about uh, making sure that there, there are uh, strong, clear uh, SOPs in place to ensure compliance. Um, compliance is becoming uh, and actually has been always been uh, one of the, I would say, 
key important elements that need to be considered in the patient support programs. What we are noticing is that um, because more and more uh, markets are introducing now uh, patient support programs um, in, in their own um, uh, space, we do expect that uh, there will be an increase in terms of uh, auditing these patient support programs. Uh, therefore, it's very important to ensure that your data uh, is uh, it's secure and compliant and you are re ready for a, a potential uh, audit um, in, in the future in relation to your uh, PSP. Last but not least, let's remember about the importance of hiring the right people, the right mindset and training them regularly. PSP, like potential other um, fields in, in our healthcare environment. It's a very dynamic, it's a very complex one. The regulatory part in terms of PSP is changing, is dynamic. So it's very important to train your, um, your PSP um, experts on a regular basis, both in terms of regulatory, compliance, but also new um, uh, innovative solutions that are coming in the market in relation to um, services to uh, patients. Going next, to conclude, uh, to conclude um, in the interest of time, um, so I would like just to, to close my presentation, uh, highlighting out, uh, a couple of key emerging trends that I'm personally very excited to watch over the next two, three years in relation to patient support programs in Asia. One um, is uh, we do expect that, um, and, and that is very much related to Alex and Vikram uh, observations, uh, because patients are actually increasing their interest in disease management and to, to take ownership of their care. In, in relation to patient support programs, we do expect that um, we'll see, we'll leverage more digital technology and single cloud platform in order to, to provide uh, patients with this kind of engaging experience. In a second, I would say a trend, emerging trend, um, is in relation to the type of PSP that we will see in the near future. Um, if today most of the PSP, as previously mentioned, are mainly focused on access, going forward, we, we expect to see a, a, switch uh, a switch towards convenience and patient education. In terms of uh, uh, payers and, and reimbursement, the uh, entire access environment, as HCPs and payers, they are expect to, to move more uh, towards more of value-based uh, 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 model. Um, and they are actually looking into patient outcomes and patient satisfactions. Um, we see patient support programs as addressing these this needs um, and leverage the PSP going forward for generating patient outcomes and also real world evidence. Now, in terms of pharma, and, 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 and this is especially for, uh, for, for, your, uh, for you, pharma, uh, based on our discussion that we have uh, with different uh, companies, we do uh, realize that pharma, they start in embracing patient support programs as a potential um, you know, um, tool for driving competitive advantage and, and deliver superior patient outcomes. So in this context, we believe that patient support programs will slowly but surely uh, move um, beyond one drug, one PSP model to a more integrated collaborative one. Um, as you might know, in some parts of the world, there are also collaboration among different pharma companies, of course, non-compete ones, in order to provide this patient support um, uh, services um, to, to, to their own patients. And last but not least, in terms of uh, something that is very relevant for, for myself and, and, and for us, in terms of patient service provider, what we are noticing is that we are uh, starting seeing patient, uh, pro, uh, patient service provider that are more focusing to end-to-end -to -end services, um, developing and providing compliant and integrated platform solution. And of course, this is coming as a, a response to your needs um, as, a, as a pharma company, as a manufacturer, for leveraging PSP as much as possible 
to understand the, uh, the journey of your uh, patient. And with that, um, I think I will close my presentation for today. Of course, there are many things that needs to be discussed about PSP, and we all look forward to continuing our, our discussion uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christiana. And um, I'm going to start looking at the questions that have been coming in and assigning them at, uh, to, to the people that are responsible. So um, the first one we received was for Vikram and Alex, and maybe um, Vikram, I can hand this over to you. Um, what are your views on how the public healthcare systems will cope with delivering care to patients during and after COVID, mainly with the surge in healthcare use as caseloads go up, but also with financial constraints from lower government revenues, et cetera? Hi, Sheena. I'll, uh, I'll start if you don't mind, because uh, Vikram tends to have a better answer. So if I get going first, it tends to help me. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, look, um, the 30 second answer here, it's a great question, um, is that Yes, COVID patients and, and the, uh, the the testing, the PPE and so on is expensive today. Um, but the, the real strain, make no mistake, the real strain is going to come later when it comes to postponed procedures or the preventative actions that would have otherwise been taken, but people are too afraid to go to a hospital and get things done early. Um, and so that impending backlog is the real concern in different markets. Um, we're seeing 80% of, of, of sort of elective utilization come back. In, in others, it's still low at 40%. Uh, but as that comes back, it's going to it's going to drown the system in quite a lot of uh, demand. And so, in the face of that, I think there's you know there's really just three three options and two, three avenues that can be taken here. You know, one is just in a in a very sort of special situation, being able to allocate more funding. You know, this is uh, a critical national infrastructure now, and that's the way it's being perceived by many of the governments across the uh, across the region. And so there is a, an, an important need to main better, maintain better control over supply chains, ensure that it's sufficiently funding, and and so on. But to be honest, right now, uh, you know, many of these systems, as you will know, are, are breaking down. Um, you know, COVID patients are coming in and they're being sent home and told to stay home. Um, you know, it, and they may be living in in um, in situations where they are in close contact with other people in the inside that household. Um, and so, the first option: allocate more funding. Some aren't going to be able to do that. Uh, the second is one that actually has been. Um, top of mind, a top priority for many governments uh, across the region, and that's just finding ways to improve efficiency. The nearest and clearest way to do that is price controls. Typically, it's a back and forth with physicians, with hospitals, with pharmaceutical groups and so on. But in many markets, we have seen um, uh, price setting, price benchmarking um, uh, that, that, that really come in as a just a, a need as the government tries to cover as many um, of its citizens as possible, uh, there needs to be um, a reduction in margins uh, for that patient type. And then lastly, a, a longer term, but a, a strategic shift that many of especially the universal healthcare uh, focused markets are doing is trying to offload as much of the patients that can pay for their own care to the private systems and the private sector. Um, and, and that's indeed the longer term objective of many of these uh, of these universal healthcare coverage markets as they seek ways to find uh, make it cheaper, easier for um, uh, for patients to migrate onto some sort of uh, some sort of private insurance, even if it's a hybrid form, so that the private sector can take on uh, a fair share of the burden. Anything you would add, Vikram? Well, Alex, very much aligned with you. I think you know just just the one point I would highlight is. Uh, we saw the role of government increase in, 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 in paying for healthcare across the region over the last few years, as, as we've seen versions of universal healthcare uh, roll through you know, the Philippines, Indonesia, India, and other markets. I think what you will see is uh, healthcare will move even further up on that, uh, on that list for most governments, uh, and you will see more, more investments behind public infrastructure. And again, this is a, a medium to long-term view what that will mean for many of the, the participants on this, this webinar is a, a lot more people getting access to care, so a lot more volume, uh, albeit uh, with, with, with margin pressure uh, and, and, and pricing pressure. But, but macro, we think we, we, we believe that the governments will, will have to step up more so their citizens will demand it, and this crisis has shown uh, the vulnerabilities in, in, in many healthcare systems. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I think we can go to the next question. 
Uh, please provide an example of a successful PCP in uh, Asia market. I guess, Christiana, this is maybe um, something for you. Sure, thank you, Shina. Um, yeah, so that is, that's a very good uh, question. So we do have uh, several um, success stories um, uh, across Asia, some of them uh, related to um, uh, affordability, other related to um, access and uh, adherence. Um, so what we have, of course, I will not be able, due to confidentiality reason, to go into the details of, uh, um, of our programs. But what we can, I, I can highlight, for example, is that um, we have programs, and, and mainly if I'm thinking about uh, oncology or diabetes, that through uh, patient uh, uh, patient uh, um, assistant programs or patient loyalty programs, we are able to, to see an increase in terms of the adherence of the patients um, across, um, um, across uh, cycles. Um, so I will, um, uh, I, I can follow up uh, offline with you on, on, uh, on this element. So please let us know your contact details. And we could detail more about several success stories that we have either in relation to affordability or main patient support programs um, uh, um, or other type of program, depending on your type of uh, uh, needs that you have in relation to the patient support program. Thanks, thanks, Christiana. Um, I'm going to stay with you because there's another question for you. Um, how does the fragmented regulatory environment impact how PSPs are done in Asia? Also, who can give us guidance and what can we do and what can we not do? Yeah, yeah, that is a very important question. And, and we do get this, kind of, this type of questions when we are uh, meeting uh, pharma companies. So indeed, in, in Asia, across Asia, the regulatory system is very uh, fragmented um, and also very dynamic. Um, uh, changes are happening in terms of uh, the, um, the procedure for the guidance for conducting a patient support uh, programs. What might be um, uh, valid in one market uh, and the type of the interaction that you might have in, with an ACP is one market might be very different in other markets. That our recommendation and what we recommend to, to our uh, pharma companies is you need to, first of all, uh, understand the local regulation in each market before um, developing and executing a patient support programs. Uh, uh, local regulation are very different from one market to the other. Secondly, um, please also work closely, identify one or two um, physicians, ACPs, um, to work closely with when you design your patient support programs because they do have a very good understanding um, in terms of the um, regulations related to patient support programs in that respective market. Uh, third, uh, ensure that when you partner with your uh, patient support uh, uh, providers, they do have a very uh, good understanding of the regulatory environment and also they have a compliance uh, solution that they are providing to you to address this level of, of complexity. And fourth, uh, ensure that also your compliance team um, in your company is engaged in developing this program and regulatory team as well in order to address all these kind of uh, differences, fragmentation in the regulatory environment. Okay, thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Thank you for that. Um, our next question, I think, um, how is the relationship between the physician and pharma and medtech companies changing during the pandemic? I guess this is for um, our friends from Bain. No, very, very happy to, to jump in and share perspectives. Of course, I think uh, as most of the participants on this webinar are, are living and breathing this, uh, you know, we saw that 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 relationship between the sales rep and the clinician really get appended over the last several months as physical access to many sites of care was, was, was completely shut down. Now, what's interesting is in, in some research we have very recently done with a, our analytics partner in India is we saw that there was a 40% increase in physicians engaging with scientific content that came from, uh, from pharma and, and, and med tech companies. What was also interesting is when you speak to physicians today, 
after they've had a chance to engage with, uh, with their, their sales partners uh, more virtually, 85% of them see a world where they would like to see much more engagement digitally uh, with their pharma and med tech providers. And so we think going forward again, that relationship will, will become much more omni-channel. I don't think that uh, the in-person component will completely disappear, but, but on balance, you will see a lot more digital engagement, probably more so than, than, than in-person engagement between clinicians and, and, and sales reps. Thank you very much, uh, Vikram. Uh, Christiana, I think we have one more question for you as well. And I, I just want to let everyone know, I realize we have already hit our one hour, hour time. Um, we will continue answering questions. And for those that need to drop off, uh, you will find the recording, as I mentioned, on YouTube and on our website. So you can either stay on and listen to the rest of the questions, or you can watch the recording uh, later on. Um, so, Christiana, the next question is, how receptive are pharma companies towards gathering patient data even at cohort level today? How can we address potential compliance concerns with regards to collecting insights? Yeah, thank you, Shina. Um, as mentioned during uh, my presentation, um, so initially, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the focus uh, of on data in relation to patient support programs was, I would say, a, a second priority for most of the patient support programs. What we have noticed during the past years is that there is an increase of interest uh, among pharma companies to consolidate this data at the regional level in one um, uh, centralized um, uh, integrated IT solution and start actually uh, conducting an analysis on the patient support outcomes. Pharma companies, they are realizing uh, the potential that PSP is having in terms of uh, um, data and insight generation. So we do see uh, an increased appetite for pharma companies to leverage PSP and consolidate the, the insights um, across markets um, uh, recently. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, Alex, I don't know if you also have some, some input or insights to this. Sorry, apologies, was, uh, was on mute. Um, no, I think I, I, uh, I echo those points. Um, ultimately, um, I think there is a um, there is a real interest in uh, being able to drive up the efficiency, the outcomes and so on. And so with that comes a, a natural need to get on top of the data side um, and gathering processing. We've seen many business models in the States, in um, uh, in Asia Pacific as well, that have been very data led in the way that it aggregates data across various providers and, um, and other ecosystem participants to, uh, to drive to recommendations and, uh, and better outcomes for the subscribers to those data sets. And I think that's really where we have to go. And it probably bleeds on to the next question. Um, but the, the challenge that's really um, that, that this market is experiencing is that um, you know, many of the insurers, many of the providers, uh, pharmaceutical companies and so on, um, the, the level and the quality of data that they are currently capturing and currently um, manipulating is um, already has such scope for optimization. There are, there are so many insurers that are still keeping all that data from the uh, from the claims forms in uh, in what is effectively um, scanned copies of, of, of printed pages. And so all that data just needs to be captured in a much more malleable way, placed into data lakes before it's actually usable. And so in some situations, we've actually worked with clients to think through if we were to design a, a patient experience, a healthcare experience with the data capture in mind first, um, and thinking through you know, what are the various stage gates across the patient journey from early on? What are they eating? What are they, um, you know, what, what pharmaceuticals are they taking? Uh, what symptoms are they exhibiting? How do we capture that longitudinal data over many years? Um, and then how do we use that to actually drive to, to, to higher quality data sets? And could that uh, type of an ecosystem even eventually cross subsidize the, uh, the level of care in that market? Um, the, the real challenge just lies today that um, just lies in the fact that today the, the data capture is just in such a poor state. And so there's a lot of investment that's going to come first. 
without a lot of immediate reward. Thanks, Alex. And I, I guess that kind of leads us to the next question about um, the online platform. And um, Vikram, if I may, I will ask you to maybe first share your opinion. Can we expect uh, such an online platform, public or private, that will connect everyone in the ecosystem? Um, are they even interested to be connected to each other? Yeah. Look, I think I think it's a it's a great question, and uh, it's one which has always been uh, you know part of the conversation with with of course many distributors, many pharma companies, many medtech companies, as well as as hospitals. I think the closest we have is, is some of the government e procurement platforms in some markets in the region. But what we have seen in the last nine months is a is a real rethinking of uh, how the supply chain would work in in this environment, and so. I do see in the future increased collaboration. Uh, I think what that's also doing is, uh, it, is, is putting the question on many pharma and med device companies around how do I build that relationship with the clinician and what is the role of the platform in being able to connect me with them and what is the role I build independently with, with the various stakeholders. So I think in summary, I think you will start to see more of a move toward that direction uh, much uh, more so than nine months ago. Thanks. Um, Christiana, do you maybe want to lean in as well from a DKSH perspective? Sure. Um, uh, so I think it's it's very uh, important, as I mentioned, in terms of the uh, you know uh, data collections uh, to ensure that uh, this uh, this data is collected in a, a consolidated way that will um, ensure the the um, the um, uh, the centralization and analysis of your uh, data across uh, several markets. Um, we we have uh, we have seen several IT platforms, online platform, cloud platforms uh, that now we come coming into the support of uh, pharma companies um, to collect this this type of, of data. Um, and then, of course, there are still I would say uh, early days for this type of solution. Um, but the solution are out there and they are able actually the, the beauty of the solution is that they are able to provide an engaging ongoing um, experience uh, an ongoing engagement uh, of different uh, stakeholders in the same time while of course uh, providing uh, um, uh, an, um, uh, compliant way of collecting the data and analyzing the data. So they are on the in the market solution that they are um, offering the possibility to engage uh, ACPs, patients, um, um, PSP coordinators, uh, the entire um, uh, care network um, in order to improve ultimately uh, the medical outcome of uh, of the patients. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christiana, for that as well. Um, and here we come to our last question of the day. Um, Alex, I'm going to send this one over to you because it refers to the single touch point that you also mentioned in your presentation. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit um, as the, the question is around, is this for all pathologies, various solutions, and how do we gather the different stakeholders in many cases, also competitors onto one platform for the convenience of the end user? Certainly, Shina, thank you. And, and as I was reading through the question, I actually I wasn't sure if it was a question or a statement. The question is, how do we gather the different stakeholders, in many cases competitors, to the same platform for the convenience of the end user? Um, and uh, that, that, is, that is the ultimate question. And in many ways, um, there's, there's a few ways to think about it. One is um, there's historical data that has been captured uh, that in many cases is printed on paper in storerooms or in archaic systems that's just going to be hard to access for a given patient. And in other ways, it's um, it's actually something that you can think about with a much more forward looking view, which is to say, uh, how do I as a healthcare ecosystem provider payer on the insurance side, on the uh, primary care side, uh, on the, even on the hospital side, I think about every patient that comes into my hospital how do I ensure that going forward, I am capturing everything that I need to capture uh, about, my, uh, about my patient? And I think what you'll begin to see is that first and foremost, these individual micro ecosystems, it might be 
uh, a given hospital group, say across Malaysia and, and, and Singapore, will ensure that they are capturing unique patient identifiers and are in capturing patient information across the inpatient and outpatient journey. Um, and then once they've built up that mass of malleable data, uh, then it starts to become interesting when you combine it with perhaps the same level of data that might be captured by uh, an insurer or by a primary care provider or, or what have you. And so I think, you know, in the absence of um, some major shift or some major initiative on the regulatory uh, front when it comes to sharing patient data, which I know in many places is already launched or underway, um, you are going to see um, pockets of this emerge within various payer provider ecosystems and those pockets will um, will be vying and competing for that data that eventually will have some value in the in the future but as I said a fantastic question and really I think it's the um, it's the age-old question of healthcare ecosystems which is how do we get the various stakeholders all working towards the same aim to uh, to work together Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think we will close our session today. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I hope it's been insightful. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. There's a generic email. You can use healthcare at dksh.com or you can reach out to me or any of the speakers today at any time. And we hope to see you at our next session and in a couple of months to come. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. DKSH, the number one in market expansion services.